Hello folks, Ram55 here. Tonight, at long last, I'm going to start a new series. And as you can tell from the loading screen, it's Kerbal Space Program. This is my favorite game right now. I've been playing it for a couple years, and it's been around for about three years in total. It has undergone many upgrades and improvements over that time. And to tell you the truth, it was rather intimidating. It takes a while to get your arms around all the... Uh, the different facets and how to do things in the game. It's not something like a truck driver simulator or even flying, which is quite complicated itself. Uh, there's a lot of different physics and procedures involved, and uh, it's a difficult game to master, and I'm still learning it myself. But I wanted to start a series, and uh, the game is still in beta form, and it's about to become officially released, I believe, here pretty soon. It's getting pretty close. they got all the ingredients in the game that they want to get. And basically what I want to do in this series is, at least initially, to recreate the NASA missions. I'm going to be launching satellites and then move through the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo programs. But after Apollo, I'll kind of deviate uh, from the NASA theme and kind of go in my own direction and explore the Kerbal system uh, with my own program. So basically my goals for this series are, number one, reproduce the NASA missions. Number two, share a little bit of history as we go along the way. And number three, the bottom line in all my games is to have fun. So recently, uh, KSP updates have changed uh, or in actually introduced a career mode where you fly missions, gather science, and then you spend science to unlock new technology. And then new technology will let you do more missions and stuff to, to get more science. That's really not my game. I, I don't want to do that. It's a little bit too tedious. Remember, for me, it's all about having fun. So I'm going to be basically playing this game in the sandbox mode. So all the parts are available right from the start. However, when I play the game, I'm going to try to you know, restrict myself to, the, uh, to a logical sequence where I get the simpler parts, simpler engines, smaller tanks and stuff early in the game. And then as I progress through, I'll start to use bigger parts, bigger engines and stuff like that. Now, I know along the way I will misspeak. I'm going to call Kerbal Earth, and I'm going to call spaceships aircraft. But basically, you know what I mean, and, you know, we'll figure it out. Now, one important point about the Kerbal system compared to Earth is it's about 70% the size of the Earth system. So when I look at the NASA parameters for orbital parameters and stuff like that, I'm going to apply that 70% to scale things down so that they fit in this uh, Kerbal space system. So while the thing's loading up, I'll give you a little bit more uh, history on uh, ex uh, space exploration. Basically, the uh, founding father of modern rocketry was Robert Goddard. He was a uh, U.S. scientist, engineer, professor, physicist, jack of all trades, had a bunch of patents. And this guy started launching solid rockets in the mid-1910s, about 1914. Pretty amazing when you think about it. In 1910, this guy was launching rockets. By the 1920s, he had already developed uh, liquid fuel rockets, and he had applied for patents for multi-stage rockets and all kinds of things along the way. Now, in the 1920s, Germany developed their own system. It was an official space rocket program, and they were concentrating on rocket-powered cars and planes, as well as just regular rockets. And they were conferring quite closely with Robert Goddard for advice on how to run their program and how to develop their program. By the 1930s, the Germans began developing rockets for military purposes. By the 1940s, under the direction of Werner von Braun, uh, they made significant improvements in the V-2 rocket and were actually using it as a terror weapon, along with the wing rocket-powered V-1 flying bomb during World War II. Uh, by 1943, Hitler made the V-2 program his highest uh, military uh, uh, priority, centered around uh, Pinamunde, Germany. As a side note, Werner von Braun was the guy who was the backbone of the U.S. program. He was actually arrested by the SS uh, uh, Gestapo because he was putting too much emphasis on space exploration and not enough on the military purposes, which is the whole reason they got him uh, into their program. Now, after the war, um, most of the German scientists, I'm going to start my game here. Most of the German scientists uh, came back to the United States and were working on the U.S. program, but some went to the, uh, to the USSR. Now I'm going to start this new program here.
And the USSR's program was very secretive. The world was not even aware of the presence of Sergei uh, Korolev. He is the father of the Russian space program. Didn't even know he existed until the 1980s when Gorbachev introduced uh, the policy of Glasnost and a lot of these uh, state secrets were made public. As early as the 1950s, the Soviets had already launched um, a few dogs into space and recovered them uh, successfully. But the purpose of their program was still uh, military in nature, uh, basically to deliver nuclear weapons. Uh, now, the U.S. program was much more open to the public, but still had a primary military purpose. In the 1920s, the United States developed the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, NACA for short. They had facilities primarily in Langley, Virginia, Murak, which is now uh, Edwards Air Force Base in Southern California, and a few others. And it involved research in, into all kinds of aviation science, not only in the design of airplanes, but rocket motors, ducting for uh, airflow through the engines, but also the effects of high altitude, acceleration, pressure, and all that stuff on the human body. So everything to do with uh, aviation science. Now, along the way under NACA, notable aircraft that were developed were the Bell X-1, which was the first supersonic aircraft, the X-15, a plane flying to the fringes of space and achieving Mach 6.7. Uh, Twelve pilots flew the X-15 in its history, and eight of them actually flew out into space, and I think I'm not sure if all eight of them, but some of them actually earned astronaut wings for qualifying for flying high enough to be in, in the space. And NACA also developed the YB-47, which was the first flying wing. Now we all know about the B-2 and the flying wing technology. It started way back in the 1940s with the flying wing. Developed the SR-71, a uh, Mach 3 plus um, spy plane, which I actually got to go up and see up close and personal when I was in the military. Uh, they developed the X-24 uh, lifting body, wingless airplane, whose technology then was used to design and fly the space shuttle. And for those of us who are old enough to remember the, the TV show, The Six Million Dollar Man, uh, you remember that airplane that came in, started wobbling as it was coming in for a landing, and then crashed. Uh, that was actually the, the X-24 wingless aircraft. Uh, and not notable test pilots that flew out of there were, of course, Chuck Yeager, first man to break the... Uh, speed of sound. Scott Crossfield, one of my personal heroes, outstanding test pilot, very involved in the X-15 program. And oh yeah, by the way, there was this uh, Air Force test pilot by the name of uh, Neil Armstrong. Uh, you may have heard of him. He went on to do some pretty important things in his life. Um, Werner von Braun, the same guy that was working on the V-1 terror weapon, was the backbone of the U.S. program. And in 1955, the U.S. announced plans to place a satellite in orbit in the International Geophysical Year 1957 to 1958. Now, Korolev, that guy that was running the Soviet program, persuaded Nikita Khrushchev, who was the Soviet premier at the time, to support and develop the space program to beat the Americans into space. Now, he looked at this as being a giant coup, a political uh, propaganda piece for the, for the Soviets. And thus, the space race began. Now, after World War II ended, the United States was very highly involved in rebuilding Japan, rebuilding Europe after the war. And uh, we had the most advanced fighters, arguably, the most advanced uh, surface ships uh, in the Navy. And we just generally felt that our technology was superior to everybody else's. So you can imagine the great shock that rippled through the United States culture when our, on uh, October 24th, 1957, the Soviets announced that they had successfully launched Sputnik into space. It took us by surprise. We didn't know they had the capability. We were trying to do it ourselves. We had tried on numerous occasions and failed, and they had succeeded. Like I said, it shook the uh, U.S. to the core, and suddenly we felt vulnerable. At that time, you know, uh, there was concern about the Soviets being able to lob uh, nuclear uh, or atomic weapons at that time over on us and bomb shelters were being dug in backyards and and uh, air raid drills were practiced in school and for people my age uh, you remember the duck and cover maneuver whenever the air raid siren went off you actually ducked underneath your desk and covered up to uh, give yourself some protection which was kind of farcical actually so in the aftermath of Sputnik President Eisenhower then reorganized uh, on NACA and that eventually involved into NASA uh, officially in 1958. Now NASA had more of a civilian purpose uh, for 
or uh, space exploration than NACA did. And it prioritized the need to get into space quickly and close the gap that the Russians had actually established. So the emphasis kind of turned away from what was going on out at Edwards Air Force Base with aircraft flying out into space and then re-entering and landing into developing rockets where you strap a man in a can on top of a rocket, blast him off into space, and that is essentially where the U.S. program went, as well as the Russian program, for that matter. Now, along the way, we're all aware that the uh, U.S. had numerous public and... Uh, public and uh, humiliating setbacks. We had rocket after rocket blowing up on the on the pad or shortly after liftoff when guidance systems went awry and all that stuff. This was very poor for morale and for international uh, prestige. And doubt started to creep in about the American capabilities and credibility. And YouTube is full of these failed launches. And if you get a chance, go look at them. Uh, they're pretty fascinating to watch. Uh, but it gives you an idea of how dangerous the program was in those early stages when people were actually getting on top of these rockets. Eventually, about three months after Sputnik was launched, the U.S. was finally able to successfully launch Explorer 1 into orbit. And it rode on top of a Jupiter C rocket, which was also called the Juno rocket, which was a modified Redstone ballistic missile. That's kind of funny because uh, whenever I, I see that Jupiter C, I always think of one of my favorite. Um, TV show, uh, TV shows growing up, which was Lost in Space. The name of their craft was the Jupiter. It might even have been the Jupiter C. I'm not sure. So the, uh, the Explorer One satellite, the first piece of hardware launched into orbit uh, by the United States, was about 80 inches long, which is about six and a half feet, weighed about 31 pounds, so not a real big payload. Had very simple electronics on board for reliability purposes. And the most uh, significant contribution that Explorer made was, besides getting the United States into the space race and bolster our ra uh, morale, was to detect the Van L. Allen radiation belt. And this was considered one of the most significant findings of the International Geophysical Year. It was launched from uh, Cape Canaveral, Florida, which later became the Kennedy Space Center on 31 January 1958 at 10.48 p.m. And you can actually go to YouTube, look that up, and you can actually see them preparing and launching that rocket into space, which was the uh, basically the birth of the U.S. space program. The orbit was uh, 224 by 1,575 miles, which converts to 358 by 2,550 kilometers. And when you scale that back by that 70% number I talked about, that converts to a 250 by 1,785 kilometer orbit in urban space had a inclination of about 33 degrees so here is my version of the uh, Explorer 1 satellite which is sitting up here on top of my rocket I have a, a three-stage rocket we got the the main first stage down here this is designed to uh, get the rocket off the pad and uh, into a uh, into space on a ballistic trajectory, and it consists of two of these FLT-800 uh, fuel tanks. It has some stabilizer fins on the bottom, four of them symmetrically placed to give it some steering as well as stability as it launches out into space. It has a single LT uh, LVT-45 rocket motor at the bottom, which is gimbaled, which will also help it steer. And at the very top. Let's zoom in on this. We have this piece right here, which is a um, uh, FLA-10 adapter, just to connect the uh, wider lower stage to the narrower second stage. Now the second stage basically boosts the satellite from its apoapsis uh, gain from the uh, first uh, stage up into its planned orbital parameters. And that consists of this piece right here, which is an Oscar B fuel tank, and at the very bottom, the smallest rocket motor, I believe, in the game, which is the LV-909. And uh, it's got this piece right here, that little gray one, which is a, I think I'm saying this right, Probodobodyne, Okoto 2. It basically gives me control once I separate the uh, satellite, which is this part right here from the second, um, second stage. 
and that way I can retake control of this stage and actually fly it back into the atmosphere. I don't want a bunch of debris just floating around in space, and once it's in orbit, it will not come down, so you actually have to change the orbit so that it will re-enter the atmosphere. Now also strapped on are a couple of these uh, Z100 batteries and a couple of these uh, uh, Oxstat solar panels to give the batteries a charge. And then the third stage is the satellite itself. Now we don't have the parts to make the, um, the satellite look exactly like the real thing. So basically what I've done is I've taken four of these pieces here. They're the uh, cubic octagonal, uh, octagonal strut, I can speak. So four of those to make up what's equivalent of the tube of the uh, Explorer. And then I put uh, four of these uh, commutatron 15 antenna on the middle, just like the, uh, the real Explorer. It had four antennas that were actually deployed as it rotated around. Remember I told you this part down here um, spins around and it actually deployed these antennas uh, once it was out into space. And then I put another one up on the top just uh, for aesthetics to make it look cool. Now at the bottom I have another um, LV909 motor, motor, but it's just for um, aesthetics. It doesn't have any fuel or any control or anything up there. Uh, so that's just to make it look more or less like the the original Explorer did, which did have a motor, and that was the fourth stage. So it launched itself up into uh, up into space, and then I put this piece right in here, which is another. Uh, I'm just going to call it an Okoto II, uh, because if I didn't have that on there, and I just launched that top part from the motor on up, um, when I go to the tracking center, it looks like and acts like debris. It doesn't look like a satellite because there's no control pieces on it. So basically I put that on there just to make it look like a satellite from the tracking center. I also put a, uh, right up here on the second stage, you can see this piece right here. It's a uh, MechJeb engineering panel, which basically gives me all these displays and, um, you know, it comes in handy when you're flying the rocket out in space because you don't have to keep flipping back and forth between the map mode and the, uh, the uh, regular mode to see what your apoapsis and periapsis and all those other things are. So that's basically my uh, my Jupiter C rocket. That's what it was in Lost in Space. It was Jupiter 2. It wasn't Jupiter C. Jupiter 2. Anyways, Jupiter C rocket, also known as a Juno, is a modified modified Redstone. With my Explorer payload on the top. So let's take it out to the pad and get it launched. Okay, so here we are out on the launch pad. We have our uh, Jupiter C rocket with the uh, Mariner satellite perched on the top. We can see the uh, vehicle assembly building in the background there. So we are getting ready for the launch. And as you know from watching other videos, you can hit the T key to turn on the uh, stabilizing system to give the rocket uh, more or less gyroscopic stability as it's going up to keep it pointed in the right direction. When I hit the Z key, it gives me 100% throttle. Now just after liftoff, I'm going to rotate the aircraft to uh, 33 degrees and that'll give me the correct inclination when I actually turn the rocket over on its side after launch. And I'm going to be throttling back to keep my velocity to under uh, 200 meters per second. Uh, low in the atmosphere, it's very dense air, and to go fast in dense air costs a lot of fuel. So if you keep it under 200 meters per second, you burn less fuel. And then once you get above 10,000 meters, then you can throttle back up because the air is thinner and you get more bang for your buck out of your fuel. So we are ready to go. So let's get this thing launched. So we are airborne, and right now I'm going to rotate to about 30 degrees. 33, 31, that's close enough. And I'm watching my uh, velocity. It's 120 meters per second now, and as I get through 150, I'm going to start slowing it down. Looks like we have a good launch so far. Everything's going very well. So 150 meters per second, I'm going to start throttling down gradually. 160, a couple more notches of uh, 
throttle out, climbing through about 5,000 meters. Again, when we get to 10,000 meters, we want to throttle back up and start our turn over on its side, getting us into orbit. This is about as low as I'm going to put the throttle. Looks like it's about, what, 70% throttle or something like that. We're 180 meters per second, climbing through 8,000 meters. I'm also looking at my apoapsis height. We want to get that up to 250. We're at 200 meters now, going through 10,000 meters, and we can start our turn. If the uh, nav ball on the bottom, the V is what I'm steering with. The uh, yellow circle that looks like an airplane is my flight path marker. That tells me where the airplane, or the, airplane, the uh, uh, rocket is actually pointing. And as it accelerates, it will actually catch up to where uh, I'm trying to get it to go. So now we've got it on the correct rotation. It is going much where we want it to go. I'm looking at apoapsis height, and I'm just going to fly that up to about 250,000 meters, so like through 100,000. And as we get higher, you'll see that it accelerates faster and faster because there's less air to resist and slow us down, going through about uh, 200. I'm going to slow the throttle down so I don't overshoot my mark. And we are at 250,000. So now that I am going to reach the altitude that I want, I can come down and look at the orbit view. You can see that we have an inclined orbit of about 30 degrees. And I am going to add a maneuver note so that we can figure out how to burn to get ourselves in the orbit that we want. Now I'm going to pull on the prograde mark, which is that one that looks like an airplane, until that node on the far side gets to uh, our target of 100... Uh, 1,785 kilometers. That'll be 1,785 meters. Going through 1 million right now. 500, 600, 784. So that's perfect. This one stays at 149. So we're going to call up the nav ball on the bottom of the screen. Tells me that we've got about four minutes before we get to the point where we uh, burn our uh, motors to establish that uh, that orbit. It's going to be about a 22 second burn on the engines. And as if you uh, you've probably been watching other videos that tell you that you don't want to wait until you get down to zero seconds to start that burn. You want to have uh, you want to bring your engine on equally on both sides of that uh, that countdown. So basically divide that in half, 11 seconds. 11 seconds to the zero mark. I want to start my burn. It'll go to approximately uh, 11 seconds afterwards. Now the other thing, I'm going to be using the uh, first stage to get me most of the way up there, but I don't want that stage to be in orbit. So what I'm going to have to do is watch my periaps very closely. I, don't, I want to keep that below 30,000. Uh, meters uh, and then separate it so it will fall ballistically back to Kerbin and then I will use the second stage to continue to push me off into the orbit that I need. Uh, so we are now about three minutes away from the burn time. I'm going to accelerate time just a little bit. I don't want to go too fast. I don't want to overshoot the mark and um, here's my alarm clock going off three minutes prior to the burn. But I'm going to count that down to about one minute at a higher rate of speed. Then I'll slow it down. And right now we're just coasting up to that altitude. And when we get there, we want to align ourselves with the blue node, which will be more or less aligned with our prograde vector. And as you probably know, you um, lengthen the distance the orbit is from Kerbin on the opposite side from where you burn. So we're burning on the left side where the maneuver node is, but the orbit will grow on the opposite side. So again, I'm going to burn fairly aggressively at first and then throttle back and watch my periapsis making sure that it doesn't go above 30,000 feet. So we are 11 and it's time to burn. Watch my periapsis as it's growing. And I need to 
throttle back. Watching it very carefully now. Still haven't established in orbit. Now it's getting to the point where it's gonna pop out the other side, telling me that I'm in the atmosphere. And we're gonna stop it right there at 31,000 feet. I'm gonna go back to the uh, spacecraft and we are gonna separate it. And the um, first stage is now gonna fall harmlessly back to Earth. I want to align myself with that blue node, and I'm going to activate the second stage. And now watching my carry apps, we're going to fly that all the way out to 1,785,000 meters to establish the orbit that I want. It's going through about 400,000 now. 500,000. And as we approach that spot, I am going to slow the uh, burn down so that I can control it a little bit more accurately. Again, we're looking for 1,785. there. And there we have it. We have now established ourselves in orbit. Let's take a look at that in the uh, big mode. You can see it's not quite aligned where we were. That's because of the delay in getting it out there. But our, our nodes, I believe, are approximately in the right position. We're 249 by... 1,784,000, so that's pretty darn close to the orbit that we wanted to do. Now you can see when we line up our uh, plane, we are inclined at about 30 degrees. We're not in the same plane as the rest of the solar system or uh, the moons, and that's the way it was in real life. Um, and as I told you before, the um, second stage which is this part right there that's attached to the actual satellite, about the size of a uh, old-fashioned washing machine, was actually spinning. And I'm going to actually spin it right now. So I'm going to take the SAS off, and I'm going to put some rotation into it. Kind of sort of the way it was in real life. And then I'm going to separate the stages. And there's our satellite spinning around in orbit. Now I'm going to go back to this, turn SAS back on, which will stop the rotation, and I'm going to uh, basically wait for it to reach the periapsis and uh, fly it back into the atmosphere. So let's go back to the map mode, and you can see our vehicles are right here. And they have to get all the way around here before I can actually turn that uh, second stage around and retro burn to decrease the orbit. If I did it here, the larger part of the circle to the right there would shrink down, but I would run out of fuel before it actually got back down into the atmosphere and it would remain in orbit. I don't want that to happen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to accelerate time and let our second stage and the um, satellite get around to that node on the far side. Once I'm there, I will turn the second stage around, burn backwards to slow the orbit down, slow the speed down, so that the node that's nearest to Kerbin will actually fall back into the atmosphere. Now I could set a node up right here. In fact, let's just do that. And that will tell me how much time it is till we get there. And according to this, it's uh, about 26 minutes from now. And again, we're accelerating time. I'll get an alarm clock telling me when we're about three minutes from that. We don't need that anymore. You can see the nav ball on the bottom that the uh, 
spacecraft is naturally, without me doing anything, almost lining itself up perfectly with the uh, retrograde marker. So there it is. Close the alarm clock. Let's go back to the uh, stage so we can kind of watch what we're doing. It is already aligned with our retrograde vector. Now, one of the sad things uh, about this is when I put that spin on the satellite like it was on the real vessel, um, when I accelerated time, that disappeared. It takes all rotation out, so it's no longer spinning, which would be kind of neat if we could just keep it spinning the way the real thing was. So we can probably burn at any time now, but uh, I'm going to wait for this to count down to zero. Again, this is our second stage, just drifting in space. We're about 1.7 million uh, meters above Kerbin, which is way down there below us, which is just totally awesome when you think about it, the vastness of space. And as much as that distance uh, seems like a phenomenal distance, it is nothing compared to the rest of the uh, solar system and universe. And just the, the sizes that you deal with, they're just, they're incomprehensible, really. So let's uh, a little bit faster, we'll count this down. To a few seconds prior to our uh, maneuver node and we're all lined up. SAS is turned on. We're just going to fire that um, booster and this will deorbit. We just run it all the way out of fuel. So we're going to go back to the map mode. You'll see what I mean. Now that orbit, because we retro burned, firing against the direction of travel, shrunk the node that was on the uh, closer side to Kerbin, and I'm going to take uh, SAS off. So we are just now free falling, and because that blue line is now intersecting with the planet, we are going to have it fall right into the planet uh, as planned. And I don't see the booster out there. So that might mean it's already back, uh, crashed into the surface. So let's go back and take a look at our second stage. I'm going to turn off all these things so we just get a beautiful view of Kerbin, our second stage, and I'm going to accelerate time and we'll follow it as it falls back into the atmosphere and destroys itself. As it gets back into the atmosphere, the uh, time acceleration will automatically stop and go back to real time. And it looks like we may be falling through the atmosphere at night, but that's fine. So here we are over on the side, and you can see that it looks like we're going to impact the land perhaps, but that will probably change. No, we're going to be in the water. And see, that will change as we uh, hit the atmosphere and slow down even more. We're about to see the, uh, the effects of re-entry as we start to burn up in the atmosphere. Pretty awesome display of pyrotechnics. That starts right around 30,000 meters. We may get some mock effect here, which is going to be the white plume. There it is, going through the uh, sound bearer here as it continues to slow down. And eventually we're going to get to the point where it's going to be difficult to see, but it's going to impact the water and absolutely destroy itself, which is exactly what we want. We want it out of the orbit. We just want the, the satellite left airborne.
know if you can see it on uh, YouTube or not, you can just barely see the details of the water coming up, indicating we're getting lower and lower. Silhouetted, silhouetted against the equivalent of the Milky Way. Those are not clouds out in the distance. Those are, as uh, Carl Sagan, one of my heroes, would say, billions and billions of stars. So that's the equivalent of the Milky Way, the solar system that Kerbin is in, or the, the universe, the um, galaxy that the uh, Kerbin system is in. There you have it. We have destroyed our vehicle. Let's go back to the tracking station. And as we pull out, there is no first stage left, so it's already re-entered the atmosphere and destroyed itself. And let's go out and take a look at my version of Explorer 1. And as you can see, it is no longer rotating, so it's stationary in space, but that's our first satellite. So I hope you enjoyed uh, this exhibition. Uh, there'll be more to come. If you like this series, give it a thumbs up. If you have comments, uh, please leave your comments. I'm always trying to make my videos uh, more interesting, more informative. And subscribe to this channel if you'd like. And thanks for watching. We'll see you soon.